This is Dr. Bess Miller, and I am here with Dr. Wayne Shandera. Today's date is March 8, 2017, and we are in Atlanta, Georgia at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I am interviewing Dr. Shandera as part of the Oral History Project, The Early Years of AIDS, CDC's Response to a Historic Epidemic. We are here to discuss your experience during the early years of CDC's work on what would become known as AIDS, the Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. Dr. Shandera, do I have your permission to interview you and to record this interview? Yes, you do, Dr. Miller. For this oral history on the early years of AIDS at CDC, we are focusing on the first several years, beginning June 1981, with the publication of the first MMWR on the five cases of pneumocystis carinii pneumonia among homosexual men in Los Angeles, where you were stationed. You've had a very impressive career since those days, involving teaching, research, and clinical care. And I know you have been involved in doing research and mentoring on HIV AIDS and providing clinical care to patients with AIDS for many years throughout your career. And we will want to hear about this as well. Let's begin with your background. Would you tell me about where you grew up, your early family life, and then where you went to college? I grew up in Texas. Uh, I was born in Fort Worth and put up for adoption at two days of age. I grew up in San Antonio in a Czech and German household. The name Shandera is Czech, and it means equivalent to Sanders or descendant of Alexander. Um, my mom was of a German background, and they were uh, descendants of people who settled in the 19th century in the, in, in the Texas German and Czech towns. Uh, I had a very large extended family, uh, a very loving environment. Uh, I went to a, a Catholic grade school, a private high school, and then uh, received partial scholarship to go to Rice University in Houston. I attended Rice for four years and then was accepted to Johns Hopkins for medical school and spent uh, the four years in Baltimore uh, matched in internal medicine at Stanford in California and spent three years at Stanford. Who or what influenced you to go to medical school? I had an uncle who was a physician in downtown San Antonio. He was a GP who had an abundant practice and did a lot of gynecology and uh, he was something of a, a role model. And then in medical school, I remember William Greeno was an outstanding example of someone who combined the love for the sciences with the service. He'd worked in Bangladesh. And, mm. and um, then at uh, Stanford, I had a number of attendings who were in infectious diseases, uh, Tom Merrigan, Jack Remington. And I remember them, them fondly and uh, the impact they had. And it was actually uh, Jack Remington who recommended my going into CDC. Tell us more about that. Uh, it sounds like you were kind of a superstar. Medical school at Johns Hopkins, internship and residency at Stanford, and, and then fast forwarding after EIS and infectious disease fellowship at Mass General. So how did CDC fit in there for you? Was that a difficult decision? Well, CDC was uh, a surprise. I didn't exactly know what it was about. And I think most physicians don't. And after you've trained for three years in internal medicine, you want to do that. And then you end up in an office uh, with a completely different mindset from individual patients to group mentality. And it, it's not always a, a facile transition. And at times I would work at volunteer clinics. I did that at the Venice and Silver Lake clinics in Los Angeles in the evenings free just to be able to use some of my medical skills for residency days. Um, but at the same time, CDC is something of a fraternity, and especially when you're in the field because you interact constantly with other field officers. We sent reports to each other, and these were pre-email, pre-fax days. Uh, we would send by mail reports of what we were doing, and Lyle Conrad was the director of field services, and, uh, and I remember sending him reports as early as October about a case, cases of unexpected lymphadenopathy occurring among gay men in, in the uh, San Fernando Valley uh, of Los Angeles. So uh, when you talk about field services and so on, 
you went through this what they so-called match to try and yes. Uh, they have certain assignments at CDC headquarters, others in the field, and you matched with Los Angeles Field Service. Did you want to be in the field? No, or I really thought that? I wanted to be in the center. I had more personal reasons for being back in the South, elderly parents, reestablishing friendships and relationships from Baltimore days. And I thought I wanted to be back in Atlanta, but I matched um, in Los Angeles, and I was a bit surprised. I included it because I thought it might be interesting, but I think it was my tenth choice or something. Mm -hmm. So, tell us a little bit more about the beginning of that, the setting of that assignment. You wind up with Los Angeles, you move out there. What was the scenario at, you were at the Health Department? I was at the LA County Health Department. Okay. California's and divided into the group in Berkeley and the group in Los Angeles, the LA area being almost half the state in population. So the, CDC has the equivalent of a state for Los Angeles. And I was an EIS officer in sharing office space with a parasitologist who wrote the local health bulletin. And it was a vast uh, communicable disease network that worked out of that office with a specialist in only hepatitis and others for mm. uh, hospital acquired diseases and a statistician just for the office. And it was a large group. Who was your supervisor? Uh, Shirley Fannin. Mm -hmm. who grew up in the hills of Kentucky and was a, a, a single pediatrician who adopted a child with congenital heart disease. And uh, she was well known by the medical community and the public because she was often on television and uh, enjoyed the limelight and was quite a colorful figure. Now, was she the head of the health department in LA? No, um, who she was, was the head of, of the communicable disease. Okay. And you're asking me who the head of the health department was, and the name escapes me for okay. the moment. Okay. But I remember Shirley Fannin as being right. a mm -hmm. very larger than life. She was. As Lyle Conrad said, she had a heart of gold, and she'd you know, do anything for you. Uh -huh. So uh, what did you begin doing in this, in this assignment uh, before the AIDS issues? How I had an abundance of activities. I had an outbreak of... Uh, stillbirths in Long Beach, an outbreak of epidemic neuromyasthenia that a neurologist in Santa Monica identified, an outbreak of uh, uh, diarrhea at a daycare center in East Los Angeles, an outbreak of bacteremic Campylobacter throughout Los Angeles County, mm. another of uh, epidemic non-A, non-B, which is now C, hepatitis, so you with stem bored. cell donors. By no means. There were an abundance of things to do in Los Angeles, right? And um, you mentioned Lyle Conrad, and he was the head of the field services. In Atlanta, that's in right. In Atlanta. Mm -hmm. um, what was your relationship with, with Lyle? Did, you, did he supervise you as well? Well, I think he kept us at a distance. We, we, we did, he, he was sort of avuncular or paternal, and he uh, didn't keep a days on. Uh, he didn't have supervised projects. I kind of wanted a more academic experience with learning to write, and mm -hmm. and that's part of the reason I asked for a transfer to enteric diseases because my roommate from college worked with Paul Blake and told me about the great experience in enterics with learning to to write and more of an academic discipline. So your second year, did you move to headquarters? I moved to. Enterics, oh, that's right. Oh, tell us about that. That's right. Yeah. Well, you know, th that was interesting because I got to Enterics just when everyone had either retired or left, and there were only Paul Blake and myself in the office for the first week. I think Dave Taylor was in Southeast Asia, uh, and, um, and one of the other principal investigators, too. But um, I had several outbreaks that I was sent back to my hometown of San Antonio to investigate a typhoid fever outbreak. And so I did had, that round out your EIS experience? Oh, very much, very much, right, exactly. Let's shift our focus to what was to become known as AIDS. How did you become aware of the early cases of pneumocystis carinae pneumonia among gay men in Los Angeles? It was largely because of my acquaintance with Mike Gottlieb. He is an immunologist allergist, and I think it's interesting that an allergist broke the outbreak. Uh, he was at Stanford when I was at Stanford. 
He was on the consultation service with Hal Holman as the attending. He was the fellow and I was the resident mm. in April of 1981. And that proved to be a key relationship because we were both moving to LA at the same time. He was moving to UCLA as a faculty member and I was downtown. And being in the habit of going to medical grand rounds, I often went to UCLA and I, I'd sit with him and talk about, oh, we need to do a project. We had to think of something mm. together. And we just thought about Dr. Kalin at Stanford and HLA B27's association with gastroenteritis. We thought, well, what can we do? And we couldn't quite identify a project. But then over the ensuing months, he called and I uh, mean, several times about something unusual occurring among uh, gay men in Los Angeles, and that later he saw cases of pneumocystis. He had three cases at UCLA. There was a fourth at Cedar sinai that a colleague identified, and then he came down to my office, and lo and behold, there was a fifth at St. John's Santa Monica on the, the my desk that day. And I've never been able to explain if this is just some supernatural serendipity or what exactly it was the case. I know that, that Betty Agee and Shirley Fannin, the two directors of the office, knew many doctors in the area who were involved with the care of, of patients with this unexplained lymphadenopathy. Uh, they didn't know what it was. In fact, one of the leading lymphoma pathologists at USC called our office in December of 1980 Mm. and asked for an explanation of six cases of distinct pathological uh, entity with, with unexplained limb dynopathy. And my office mate, the fellow who worked in parasitology, and I said, oh, it must be either uh, gay or drug use, as we thought that was the question. We interviewed the six, and we could get risk factors for only two of them. We couldn't pin it down. So we knew for months that something unusual was going on. And I remember in the reports to... Dr. to Lyle Conrad that I would say, these look like the cancer patients I saw at Stanford. They looked so, uh, they, they seemed to be so immunosuppressed, the ones we were hearing about, that they had Canada, uh, they had the kind of manifestations of an immunosuppressed state. Mm, that is incredible. Um, so, by July 4th, an additional 10 cases of PCP were reported among gay men in California. Uh, and August 28th, 108 cases of one or both of the two diseases among gay men were reported nationally, and 40% had died. Did you have the opportunity to see some of the patients? Can you describe I saw the very that? first patients. As I said, I saw the one in Santa Monica. And Mike and I got together at my apartment one Sunday and wrote up the MMW article that's in uh, the PCP article. Uh, this was, as I say, before fax or email, and we had to call it in word by word to CDC and uh, the Centers for Disease Control, because it involved homosexual men, put it on the second page. They didn't want it on the first page. Of say the, more about that. Is, I, don't I, I can't say. The editor was Mike Gregg. That was their policy. I don't know anything more about it. I know that the LA Times picked it up immediately, and I got to go into uh, the kind of Lou Grant room at the LA Times in downtown LA and, and discuss it with their science writer, who immediately saw the importance of that and put it on the first page of the Los Angeles Times. So this is the, you were involved in writing the, the first very first publication, June exactly. 1981 right. MMW. And then I thought, you know, I went over to the ICU at uh, LA County the next week and there were two more cases of PCP. And what we thought was just an isolated phenomenon occurring among a, a few gay men. And at the time, we, the PCP was something that was occurred among starvation victims in Eastern Europe or patients with leukemia at Memphis, St. Jude's, that this is something unusual. I said, this is bigger than I thought. I had no idea that it was going to be the, the pandemic of the century, but I saw, you know, the next two cases, what would be the sixth and seventh at the ICU at LA County. And what were, what were your feelings about the patients? That they were unusually immunosuppressed, that it was something like, that something we thought of at the time was that uh, there was a publication from NCID, Clinical Infectious Diseases from UC San Francisco, that 
uh, CMV was particularly prevalent at that time among the gay community. I thought that maybe CMV was the cofactor that there was a killer strain of CMV mm -hmm. out CMV there. being cytomegalovirus. Cytomegalovirus, that's yeah. right. And um, so that was a real consideration. And when I moved back, I moved back to Atlanta at the end of June, so I was really involved only in the first few cases. But then I was on the task force here for a while, but at the same time was also uh, working in enteric diseases as in a very short-staffed office. So I, I, I went to about six or seven of the first meetings, and then it took off in its own other direction. And I guess mm -hmm. we, our paths diverged for mm -hmm. a while. It converged later. Mm -hmm. Well, that is incredible. Um, so they were in the intensive care unit, as presumably these people died. Two additional ones. These weren't the ones that reported. These were more yeah. cases than we. Yeah. Right. And so clinically, um, the ones in the ICU, did they have multiple uh, pathologies or just pneumocystis? I don't remember. I, we, I wasn't yeah. the caretaker for them. I just yeah. remember being told that they had mainly um, PCP, what we now call it, PJP, PCP, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. J being Jurovitz, the Czech investigator who discovered pneumocystis. Mm -hmm. Because pneumocystis coronii is a mouse pathogen. Mm. Incredible. What was the atmosphere among clinicians in LA during this period? Did you have an opportunity to go to any clinical conferences where these cases were presented? No, they wouldn't have been presented because nobody knew about this. The first reports of this actually were not an MMWR, they were the LA County News Bulletin because my coworker, the parasitologist, wrote the local bulletin reporting on flu and other entities and he said, oh, that's important. And he put it in the LA County News Bulletin. It actually preceded MMWR, but it was a local publication. Mm. Right? And there were no clinical conferences about this at the time. It was called, uh, it was, didn't have a name. It was GRID, Gay-Related Immune Deficiency. Uh, there was uh, much uncertainty. There was much concern because the epidemiology was so akin to that of hepatitis B mm -hmm. that, that the third group besides uh, gay men and drug users that come in with this were healthcare workers. So there was much fear among the medical community at the start of the outbreak that they also would be involved. Mm -hmm. Remember the surgeon at UCSF who dressed up in a space costume each time she mm. went into the OR. And there was much, much concern about that. Mm. So at that early phase, were there hypotheses? You mentioned possibly a, a CMV variant were there other hypotheses? Well, I did a small case control study at the um, Hollywood Gay Men's Center just to see if there was some unusual entity like tetracycline or another antibiotic or something that was taken. I was later criticized by doing that without, improper, without proper consent. I just felt that something needed to be done in case it could be taken off the market. And I, uh, I brought it back to Atlanta and Paul Blake looked at it and said, yeah, this is important. And, we looked at the data, there was nothing that was positive on what I could find from that small short survey, and I don't think that was ever published. Mm. We, um, I met got Mike Godley a couple of years ago. We went, he practices in West LA, and we went for, for dinner, and we both talked about the fact that there's a bit of revisionist history that's occurring with respect to this disease, and it bothers us. Tell me more about that. Yes, um, one is in, uh, Mukherjee's book, The Cancer Emperor of All Maladies, he attributes the onset of the discovery of HIV to oncologists in New York in April or earlier in 1981, and it's just wrong. And I've written the author and I've never gotten an answer. And the second is CDC itself, who claimed that there was a run on pentamidine at the time. And neither of us can remember hearing that, that people say, oh, well, we knew about this because people were asking for so much pentamidine for PCP. And uh, I would think that we worked with the group in parasit parasitic diseases uh, because PCP was considered at the time a parasite. It's since been uh, taxonomically discovered to be a fungus that was, is treated like a parasite. But it was through parasitic diseases that we worked and the group there, uh, 
later claimed that they had a run on pentamidine, but I would think that either Mike or myself would have learned about that. Hmm. In addition, Mike Gottlieb and the group at UCLA very much wanted to be the first in print to go through the peer review process of a standard publication. It would take months to a year, so it was felt that the use of the public health system was the way to get it out into print first. And uh, he called me, and that's, he wanted to have it put into MMWR for that reason. Uh, incidentally, I was listed only as the Epidemic Intelligence Service Officer because that was the, the habit at the time uh, that you did your work in a service, spirit of service, anonymously. Uh, he knew of doctors in New York that were working on a similar outbreak, namely Dr. Freeman King of Kaposi sarcoma, and he really felt that that was related to this and that was going to go into print first, and so he, was, he felt some urgency about uh, printing this material through a public health service publication first. Were you there long enough to know how reporting of these unusual cases started coming into the health department? Was a surveillance system set up at that time? For other diseases? For, a, for this unknown AIDS? No, there was no surveillance system. In fact, we, we spent a lot of time talking about Campylobacter had an outbreak of that, and we setting up a surveillance system for that in the county at the time. Um, but there, it didn't have a name. It didn't have a definition. It was only the next year that the group at CDC set up and. Uh, arbitrary construct of sort of definition to work with the entity. Mm -hmm. Okay. What about um, the political climate around this? Uh, what was that like in LA? Was there beginning to be concern among the affected populations? Was there starting to be, uh, this was the Reagan era, so, um, do you remember anything? I don't remember about a lot. I, I don't remember a lot of concern among at that moment because it wasn't well identified. I do remember that there was a real spirit of service and and working for the underserved in the LA County Health Department. Mm -hmm. That I think that philosophy, as much as anything, helped get this propelled. That there was a, an amazing sense. And and Los Angeles also had a an unusual liberal political climate, and it still does what it did at the time, that Conrad was that wonderful cartoonist in the LA Times. And and I'd go off to the, um, I lived in the Pico Robertson area of West Los Angeles, and I'd pick up the newspaper the night before, every night at the half a block away at the newsstand. And I was there the night that, that John Lennon was killed, for example. I remember mm. someone coming in and hollering that. And then in December of 1980, I remember that Conrad picked a, that was the day, right after the, the four nuns were killed in El Salvador, the Marinols working there, and uh, he took uh, a photo, of, uh, took the Pieta and reversed it, and had Christ holding one of the nuns, mm. and said El Salvador at the bottom. It was very touching. Mm. So you can see that, you know, think of LA as a rather sh shallow and superficial town, and many in Northern California would say that instantly or unequivocally, but at the same time, there was a real sense of compassion for the underserved for the migrants, for the people who needed help in that city. Mm. And I just assumed that that was kind of universal, but it isn't. I mean, LA really personified that. Tell us about any other aspects of your EIS experience. Um, when you look back at it, what, what do you think? Well, there was a lot of frustration at the time because it's so different from what you've done. The transition isn't easy from medical residency to working in EIS, and, and especially because we do most of our residencies in very academic centers, and then you go into a health department where academics is not paramount at all, that a sense of service is probably what guides the places to do things. and. Uh, and uh, it becomes a very sort of political world at times, too. Mm -hmm. And um, because of that, it's not an easy adjustment that you have to test skills that you haven't necessarily trained for. And um, you're sent back to Atlanta often to meet with others and discuss uh, how you're adjusting to it. But, and the, 
um, the day-to-day -day work is, is quite different. You're alone in an office trying to find out, you're a disease surveillance officer trying to find out what unusual is going on into your community and are you gonna be able to do this? And uh, it, it's an unusual experience. Mm -hmm. I think it, it tests you and, and trains you with talents that you don't expect. I suspect that the field services positions taught you more leadership in positions that you'd use as a health officer, for example, mm -hmm. than, than the field services where you acquire more of the skills to write, use statistics properly. Mm -hmm. right. Throughout your career as an academic infectious disease specialist and clinician, you've ended up working on many aspects of HIV AIDS, both domestically and internationally. Can you tell us some about your research, uh, for example, extrapulmonary tuberculosis in Houston and Johannesburg, or other? I've done a variety of projects, um, and I don't think I've done anything really paramount in any of this, but I've done a lot of, I've done, what I've done the most of is take care of patients. And I've taken care of indigent patients with AIDS in Houston. And that's been the basis of my career. I've attended multiple meetings. I've presented at a lot of conferences. And I w attended at the early AIDS in Africa conferences. At one, about six of us were kidnapped in Kinshasa at different times, each of us individually, ostensibly by thugs, but it was actually the local police who were doing it. So it's been a, c a career with a sense of adventure, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tell us about your experience treating indigent patients with AIDS over the years. Well, I think that it's been facilitated because of Ryan White funds, that uh, it requires support and money at either the local or national level, and then the hemophiliac with HIV from Indiana was the uh, case that resulted in the outpouring of funds from Congress for AIDS that are still being used to run a lot of the AIDS clinics. Uh, our patients in Houston are, are very indigent and some can't even afford the co-pays for their medications. And I, I, I'm concerned about what the local cuts are going to be now with their medical care. That's a real concern. So tell us about the early years. Were there uh, services and clinics before there were drugs? I did work in Parkland at University of Texas Southwestern at Dallas in 1987, and that was before, uh, that was when AZT came out. It, it was the first medication that was available. And uh, we worked there went just at the time the tests were becoming serologically available and at the time that the medications were available. And we were probably brewing resistance because we were treating with only single agents at the time. and patients came into the clinic for even candida esophagitis. They had to be treated with amphotericin three times a week. We didn't have the armamentarium of antifungals, antivirals that we have now that, I remember, I've, I've, a year before that, CDC helped me get a job teaching preventive medicine in South Carolina. And then when I was there, I saw a TV show of uh, the priest in Molokai that, uh, that had the leper colony. And, and I thought, well, that's interesting. I, you know, I should do something like that. And I had a chance to work in AIDS in Dallas. So I moved back into it, really. Uh, Father Damien, as I was mentioning, moved back into it in Dallas in 1987. And there, there was a tense political climate. Uh, there wasn't a nursing home. They would take an AIDS patient in all of Dallas or Fort Worth. Mm. And finally, one woman did and she was on national television, but the local health department found that her place wasn't clean and closed it down. There was a major church in Johnson Dallas that said AIDS, the wrath of God. There was a lot of antipathy toward the AIDS community. We, with individual patients, we found that some families were accepting, others were completely rejecting, that there was a real tension associated with the disease at that time. And it was Dr. Daniel Barbero, who ran the clinic myself, who did most of the work, and. It was difficult uh, because the patients were so sick and dying so often that uh, it was it was hard on the providers also. Mm -hmm. 
at that time. I think that's changed markedly since then, fortunately. Many people at that time and, and after that, certainly in, in Africa, um, many of the healthcare providers experienced burnout and, and just Oh, we did. I, you know, I did myself. I, I took off and I took some math graduate courses at SMU for a few months. And then I worked at the health department and got, got back into clinical medicine, but I just, you, you burned out very, very much. And then after that, I received an academic appointment back at Baylor in Houston, where I'd been an undergraduate and, and moved back into an academic role after that. Tell us more about managing those patients. Well, they became almost like family. You knew them so well at the early years because they were there all the time. That uh, a nurse and I and the social worker and his wife uh, went to, even to the funeral of a patient. And at that particular funeral, I remember the brother getting up and said, well, we didn't approve of his lifestyle, but we uh, wish to you know, offer condolences to the family, that sort of thing. That, that a sense of fear and judgmentalism pervaded even at, to, through the funerals. Mm -hmm. um, the patients were unusually kind and easy to work with, but at the same time there was an unbelievable sort of fear in the community about the disease in, in, their, in the 80s. And uh, I remember that C. Everett Koop uh, was appointed Surgeon General, which is one of the best things Reagan did about the outbreak. And because of that, he sent a letter to every household informing people about what HIV really is. And that helped uh, assuage a lot of the tension and discrimination that existed. And then Rock Hudson developed a disease, and it was the first really well-known figure mm -hmm. that had AIDS. And, uh, and he was very much the macho character on screen, but his life that acquired AIDS was otherwise. And so in the process, uh, I think people understood the disease very differently. And so I helped it. There was a, subsequently a much greater upwelling of support through fi financial groups like um, uh, the group that Elizabeth Taylor and Mike Gottlieb founded in Los Angeles. And Mike Gottlieb was involved? That was Ampar? He was, he was yeah. originally involved in that. Uh -huh. He was on the original board. I think that there were some problems in his relationship with Elizabeth Taylor and that involved, it's a public knowledge lawsuit and he was no longer in that. Right. Mm -hmm. So the patients were wonderful, they were easy to take care of, but at the same time there was a, a real sense of fear among the public at large. And I think that that is much less so now. That with the number of medications that are available and the fact that so many people know somebody who's had the disease, that, uh, it, but it's a different disease to treat now. It's more like a chronic disease. It's like treating hypertension or, or, or diabetes or cancer and in fact, Many of our patients have all of those diseases as well, so you become a primary care provider for all of those entities. Mm -hmm. Were you ever afraid for your own health? Uh, one time I had a needle stick from a patient who had AIDS after I was doing a spinal tap in a clinic that was not very well set up. And I did go on AZT for a few weeks and the, the medicine made me very sick. And Fortunately, nothing ever happened, but I had a needle stick doing a spinal tap, and that really worried me at the time. Mm -hmm. That was the only time I've really been concerned. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you look back, how did CDC training impact on your career and that, the work you've done? Well, I think it gives you a group orientation, which most physicians don't have. You think about diseases uh, of groups, and you think about prevention that each time I teach a group of students, I end up the session always talking about what can you do to prevent further hospitalizations other than give vaccinations, can you give a course of antibiotics, what else should you do to teach them to prevent future illnesses? And, uh, and, and, and the orientation toward prevention is so important so that when you hear something like on the news last night about the $1 billion cuts in prevention, it's just very disturbing. To, that it's, it's almost inconceivable that that could occur. Uh, prevention is so very important, and it's never been funded terribly well, but uh, to cut even what's available is not good. 
I think it also gave me a focus toward certain diseases and that I've kept up a, an interest in HIV and I've gone to countless conferences all over the world in and, and HIV and, uh, and I've, because I enjoy travel, that's been great, but I enjoy other cultures and getting to know them and learning languages. And I, that was a real benefit growing up in a German and Czech household. I had the orientation toward hearing other languages. And so mm -hmm. I, I, I picked them up fairly quickly and I belong to reading groups in German and French in Houston. And mm. right now I've been studying Mandarin. I was studying that when I was at CDC, but I dropped it many years. It's not easy. <laughs> Fascinating. Yeah. Were you involved uh, in, in any uh, clinical care or research internationally? Uh, I did a, a project with, on HLA and extrapulmonary TB in, in South Africa, and I presented the results at a Grand Rounds at the Chris Honeyberry Gwaneth Hospital there. And uh, I went on a mission board for a group in Guatemala and I presented at countless other meetings elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Those are the main things I mm -hmm. can think of, right? Has your faith or religion been a, a part of Well, I think it was part of the reason I went. I mean, when I first was assigned to Los Angeles, I just wanted to cast it aside. Oh, I was not going to move there. But uh, there was a part of me that said I should, and, and, and I, I th was a member at St. Anne's in Palo Alto, and I thought, well, you know, I felt that I've sent some sense of obligation, and I'm sort of glad that I said yes to that and fell through with it because it would have been very different if I'd spent my career just staying at Stanford. I think that that um, the tendency to want something very selfishly at some point in life differs very much from answering yes to an answer that you quite don't quite understand and allows you to offer yourself in a different way to the world. And mm -hmm. Uh, that's a very, very difficult issue, and it's something that people confront all the time. Which is? Uh, saying yes to those re calls and responses to go out and offer of yourself in a different way from your own mm -hmm. kind of selfish desires. Mm -hmm. uh, it sounds like it's really enriched your life. It has very much. That's right. right. It has. In closing, I'd like to ask you a little bit about the impact of AIDS on, on you in any way that we haven't discussed. You were really a part of something that changed the history and course of public health. How has that affected you personally? Well, I think as being an in internal medicine and epidemiology, there's always a great desire to know and that desire to know also involved a very personal aspect of my life, which was the adoption, which I never um, could find an answer to. I sought for 40 years and found the answer just this year in that genetic testing services by serendipity. I had an aunt who tested three, four years ago and found out that I was her nephew. And she said, how can this be? I've never heard of you. And she and her husband are academicians in Missouri and have been um, wonderful colleagues now in helping me with some of my work. We've helped me publish a book on social ethics this last year. And, uh, and I, in the process, have found the original couple who gave me up at the, a very early stage of their marriage in 1952 and wow. found that I have a whole new family with two other brothers and nephews and nephews that I never met until just these last few months. Mm. So incredible. sometimes the, the, des the desire to know was so great that when I left CDC, I went to Mass General and I worked on my fellowship, but uh, I had uh, a wonderful psychiatrist there said I had to find out what was causing this kind of deep-rooted un unknowingness. And the Harvard motto was very tough, the truth, the truth will set you free. And he really had me go in depth into this search, and I sought through many means for many, many years, but only it took an element of almost supernatural action to have an ant test on a system that I was using as well to actually find the individuals. They were ecstatic when I actually did find them, that I found the mother only 12 days before she died, and she yeah. said it was like a forest opening up. And, uh, uh, she was in ecstasy that this actually finally occurred. 
That's fabulous. Yes. Any any other final comments? No, I'm very grateful that I've had such an interesting and wonderful career, and I owe so much to CDC. And sometimes you get uh, very upset with the administration. That's natural with any organization, but in the end, I think the results have been very positive. Thank you very much. Sure.